And by the way, I've been told in those new and emerging because all in one group, because some of them are already here and not new, and some of them are more emerging. So usually we call them new and emerging. Developing new semiconductor technologies, and how does that change the value proposition of the technologies involved? Well, let's look first at the mobile applications. We have multi-die configurations coming, but the multi-die configurations, these mobile applications, change the value relationship between the logic and the memory and the analog. Now we've got to have a much more complex and robust analog system because we're looking for more data coming in from the various uh, external sources. And in particular, on the memory side, what are we doing? Well, we have an application here. We're concerned about the power, and of course memory takes a lot of power. We want to know how much of the memory power, the power is required for the memory. We want to know how much, how fast the memory is. We want to know how much is done volatile. We want to know how volatile. So from a memory point of view, if I look at this application and apply Moore's law, what do I see? Well, I see a lot of ARM microprocessors. So Moore's law says that ARM processors will be twice as powerful every two years. If I look at the memory side from and being a memory person, memory-centric view, the memory is beginning to provide the product differentiation for the, for the end customer more so than it has done and more so than it has provided in the data environment. How much is the non-volatile memory, the non-volatile memory is there, how fast is that memory, how much power is it consuming, uh, how much space is it requiring. This is what's shifting the value proposition of the new memory technologies and a lot of the work that, that, uh, that your companies are looking at. The all element in the mobile applications is the SOC uh, system on chip versus system and package side. We did a, uh, a blog uh, a couple of weeks ago noting the synergy between new memory technologies and SIPs uh, through silicon vias, multi-die packaging kinds of things. An SIP with the technologies that, you, that your companies are working on provides a much richer mix of what can be accomplished with those SIP, with the system and package kind of configurations. There is synergy between those two technologies that we don't see, that, that we see will have a significant impact. There's also the memory wall. We're doing what we call cracks in this memory wall. The memory wall, of course, was the gap between microprocessor and logic performance and the memory technologies that were kind of lugging along behind it somewhere. With the amount of technology that, or rather the amount of data that we see being moved about, there is an impact on this ratio between the two basic technologies. The traditional progress of both the logic and the memory technologies are both being challenged at this sub-20 nanosecond, or 20, sub-20 nanometer range. The memory technologies, of course, have been working on this for quite a while. They're, uh, they're pretty far ahead in, in the work that's been, been addressed over the last several years. But now we see the logic company saying, um, I think I'll go to 3D, maybe FinFET might be a good idea. Okay, we don't just step from those things as we've seen on the memory side. There's a lot of work that's coming about on both sides of this equation, both on the logic and the memory side, as we go down to that sub-20 nanometer range. In the meantime, we've got all of this data requirement that's being created within the infrastructure itself, within the processing side, within the storage side, that is going to have an impact between on the, on the memory hierarchy itself. The best example is the enterprise solid state disk drives. Okay, so here we take DRAM, and, which of course, what, 10 to the 12th, 14th endurance, uh, can be altered by a bit by bit basis, and we're taking another technology with endurance uh, erase rewrite cycles of 10 to the third, 10 to the sixth. Uh, we're substituting that into the DRAM application, and the advantage is oh, and in addition, the NAND we're talking about is block write erase erase rewrite characteristics, but even makes the the bit issues more of a critical problem. And we're doing that because the NAND 
has lower power requirements. We're doing that because we're cutting down on the power consumption and cutting down on the cooling that's required. But the point of that is that we've been experimenting with this NAND technology now, and which is the way we described it, for quite a while. In the past, all of our memory technologies have had very high endurance, very high performance. <coughs> now we've got something with a much lower range of performance in terms of the reliability, in terms of the, the high, in terms of where we're going to use it. And we're finding a huge market for it based on the lower cost per bid. So the industry is still experimenting with this idea of all of our applications don't have to be high performance, high endurance. Where is that line and what are we going to do, where are we going to go with the NAND side? We don't know. We're still working with it. We're still trying to find where that fits. But we do know that we've proven with NAND that there is a new elasticity factor between the density, between the cost, between reliability, that we've never had before when we're dealing with the old DRAM, SRAM memory hierarchy. So this is an area where we're going to be, some of the technologies coming, we're going to be looking at all of these memory technologies in a new way. We're going to find new ways to put them in. But the point is that the OEMs are saying, listen, if you can find a way to provide another level of performance, in this case, lower power and less heat, we will find a way to change the architecture. And it's the ability of the technology, the memory technology, to persuade the OEM to change their architecture that is the key point here. And we've already proven that the OEMs will do it by way of the enterprise SSDs. So changing the value of propositions of the technology that you're working on. What this means from our point of view is that who are your competitors? Well, if you're from the DRAM era, uh, it was usually the other DRAM company that may have a, a, a lower cost per bit or higher volume. But in this case, we're talking about new memory technologies, new and emerging memory technologies. Your competitor is really the company that has the ability to convince the OEM to change their architecture to fit that company's technology. So here's an example. Um, there is a new investment group. We were blogging this the other day. Uh, Rusnano, R-U-S-N-A-N-O. A Russian venture capital group now has an office in uh, Sand Hill Road in San Jose looking for new memory technologies and has already committed $300 million for an MRAM fab in, in Russia. What does that do to an OEM that's thinking about maybe I'll consider a technology? An OEM is now much more favorably disposed toward considering that technology if it knows that it has that much of a support base behind it. Not commenting on the technologies, not commenting or comparing them. The fact that there will be a reliable or potentially be a reliable consistent source of supply is a very, very meaningful thing for the OEMs. So here's the case, influencing the OEM is a competitive value. Well, what about the other company that's doing the same technology you might be, or similar one in the same area? Is that a competitor? Well, maybe not, because the OEMs have shown a strong desire to be sure that they have alternate sources. So two suppliers doing the same technology, or a similar one with, with similar performance characteristics, suddenly it's not necessarily a strategic competitor, maybe tactical competitive competing, but it adds more confidence to the ability of the OEM to commit designs and to decide they want to continue with that technology. Finding market entry points. This is where we've actually been working with a number of small companies and large companies and trying to decide, here's your technology. How do you get into the market with it? Because let's not discount learning curve theory too. The more you build a product, the more information you have. It's a, must, it's a messy way to do it, but it gets to where you want to go. You need the technology, you need the volume to drive it. Anticipating the infrastructure to accelerate high volume growth. This goes back to uh, through Silicon Via. I believe Bob Patty has an excellent presentation in the sequence also. We see synergy between the new and emerging memory technologies and SIP. And then focus on the design flexibility, the time to market, 
the end applications that we'll be all supporting in the future will have a much smaller product life cycle than we have seen in the past. That has to be recognized from the very beginning. High performance non-volatile memory and multi-die packages, compatibility with logic processes. Where did all the SRAM go? Well, SRAM is compatible with CMOS logic processes, and they're gone. Those are some of the considerations that we think. So that's what we had to say uh, to present to you today. It's just a view of uh, where the different technology is going, uh, our view anyway, and, and our uh, sense of confidence that there will be very, very strong demand going forward because the entire structure of the industry has changed now that we're focusing on new memory technologies and new applications. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for a couple questions for Bob. So does anyone? Uh, yes. Um, you mentioned that there was a power reduction in the non-volatile RAM versus the screen in the DRAM. How much of the power reduction did you see for typical DRAM sizes? So the question is how much power reduction do we get from the NAND versus the, the DRAM in some of these applications? Essentially there is no refresh cycle, of course, in the NAND, which is which is the benefit here. The, um, so all of that refresh, it's, it's almost all of that refresh that normally goes back into the DRAM side is gone. The power consumption is considerable. I could I could give you some measurements that we've done, but I can't think of any right offhand other than that that general description. Significant. It depends on the applications, significantly on the applications. You all have to also have to factor in the heat that's being generated by the DRAM refresh cycle that you no longer have to cool. So there's two elements to it. One is the cooling requirement is dropped considerably, and two is the original energy in order to maintain that refresh cycle. The applications are also critical because typically it's not the, the NAND is not being used in primary primary memory applications. It's being used in specific cache applications. But there are more and more of these opportunities we think opening up for for uh, a much broader range of the new and emerging technologies. Okay, so let's take one more. So I like a lot of what, of what you're saying. I agree with a lot. When I have these conversations with memory system architects, they always come back to me and say, "Cost per bit still matters." These factories just churn, 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 churn. They don't want to change their products. They don't want to put new things in the line. Uh, how, how do you answer that? The, the That's a good point, actually. Um, and, and yes, cost per bit, per bit does matter to them, but risk also matters to them also. And um, the cost per bit on a system level is being it, it is what's being altered. Then the driver to change that are the system level architects. They've got to team up with a system level person, that, that uh, design group that is that is convinced that this will lower the total system level activity. Yeah, it, it, it is a challenge. It is a challenge. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>